Hey everybody, this is Deb with Truthfication Chronicles, and I wanted to share something that's kind of having to do with close to home for me. And this is a guy who at currently was living in Illinois, but he was an abortion doctor here in Indiana. Now this is going to be a little bit of a tough subject, but I'm not going to deal with some of the gruesome details, of course. But I do want to give you some of the legal documents and point out why he uh, was in the situation he was in and he was no longer practicing in Indiana. So this is an article off of the WSBT website. That's a local TV station in South Bend. And this came out on Friday the 13th. I guess I kind of missed that Friday was the 13th. It's been a little busy around here, so... Anyway, this guy died and his family found thousands of fetal remains in his home. Yep, that's him and that's what he evidently collected. It's really kind of creepy. 2,246 fetal remains were found in the home of this doctor who used to perform abortions in South Bend until his license was suspended in 2015. And the guy's name is Klopfer. Dr. Ulrich Kulpfer, and he was in Illinois and passed away on September 3rd. His family members, I assume, were going in to check out the house, and lo and behold, they found 2,246 fetal remains there. I mean, seriously, who who collects fetal remains? But let's go on. Anyway, we'll get to that in a minute. This is from the Indy Star in um, 2014, and this was four physicians who perform abortions in Indiana could face disciplinary action after the Indiana Attorney General's office filed complaints against them for violations of record keeping. Now, these people right here, and of course, he's mentioned as one of them, and although it says file keeping, there's more to it than that, okay? So stick with me. I want to elaborate on some of these reports that you may be seeing because I've got information that I haven't seen in some of the other reports. So anyway, this was happening under Attorney General Greg Zeller. Now, he was the Attorney General under Mike Pence when Mike Pence was governor of Indiana because when Mike Pence was governor, he enacted some really strict abortion laws. I mean, there were some very good things that were put into that law that keep women safe and they needed to be in there. So it was an important law. And of course it got taken to the Supreme court, but just in May they ruled on it and said it was okay. So it is part of the Indiana law and the Supreme court has said, yes, it is. It's law. And one of the things has to do with how they report these abortions and keeping records of the different information and also making sure that the women are informed before they have the abortions. In fact, women have to be told personally, privately by either the doctor or one of the nurses, if there are nurses or a qualified person and it lists in the state law who is considered a qualified person. And so it can't just be somebody the doctor has hired in there. It has to be one of those people. And they have to meet with the woman privately and they have to inform them of what they're going to do, what the procedure is, and, you know, any risks that there might be, which is only logical. If you're going in for a medical procedure, you need to be told that. If you're going in to have wisdom teeth extracted, they will tell you those things. So for Pete's sake, you need to have that happen if they're working with your women parts. All right? I'm not going to have somebody messing with me down there if they don't know what they're doing. Anyway, um, that's my personal opinion. And, you know, that's something that they list here as paperwork, kind of. You know, it, it, they make it almost sound like, oh, they just didn't file the right papers. No, this is more serious. And we're going to find out, like I said, let's get into it. But this all really kicked off. And the reason this was happening was because of Mike Pence and his strong stance against abortion. Now, obviously, he couldn't make it, you know, he couldn't work it out so that abortion was eliminated in Indiana. But again, the law that exists right now in Indiana is pretty good. 
as abortion laws go, if there are any of them. But this guy started out working in Gary. And Gary, Indiana is up in what we call the region. <laughs> it's up around Chicago. And it's so it's in the northwest corner of Indiana. So that's where he was. Well, there were complaints about that. And eventually, I think that clinic closed, it says here. And this was from 2015. So, yeah, that one closed. And again, you know, Dr. Ulrich Klopfer is mentioned there. And he faces a misdemeanor charge of failing to timely file a public report. Again, the reason was because of this. And look at this. Attorney General Greg Zeller filed a 1,833-count complaint against Klopfer with the Indiana Medical Licensing Board. Look at that. 1,833. That's a lot. And that the Gary Clinic... Uh, you know, besides that, they also had a state inspection there and they found the Gary Clinic had deficiencies such as a water leak in the basement, foul smells in the patient care area and unqualified personnel. So, you know, there's part of it right there. Well, after Klopfer, you know, they had all this going on, they allowed him, they kind of put him on like a type of probation uh, they didn't call it probation, but, you know, that's basically what it was. And so then after he that, he had to be on good behavior and everything. And I guess he was and followed all the rules. Or I don't think he did any abortions, actually, during that time. I'm not sure. But then he went to South Bend, which, you know, where is where Pete Buttigieg is the mayor right now. And in there, there had this women's clinic that he did abortions in. And again, he was cited for more violations of the law. And again, he got put on this probation type thing. And then he went to Fort Wayne, which is the northeast corner of Indiana. So it's like all across the north, but it was these three different places. And in Fort Wayne, he was also cited for problems. So this guy, it just like he never learns. He did not learn. And wait until you see what I'm going to show you and you'll understand. So I went to the Indiana Medical Licensing Board. You know me. I like to go find the actual documents because they're so important and they can be so interesting to read. Well, the first one came out in September 17th, 2014, and there was a complaint. And here is that complaint because you know me. I like to go to the actual documents. So this is a 50 55 page complaint against him and it mentions the Indiana code. I will include the Indiana code for you. It, it's kind of, this is one website. Now I have it blown up to 170%. So when you put it down, it's just very tiny print. So I had to blow up that much for people to see. But yeah, it's article 34 of the Indiana code and that's abortion. By the way, Indiana does have a statement on cloning just for your information, and we are against cloning. <laughs> cloning human beings in any way in Indiana is against the law. There you go. Just gonna say that. Uh, it doesn't really say much more than that, by the way, but thought I'd draw that to your attention just in case you're interested to know that. But if you go through here, oh, it looks like it kind of jumbled up here. But it goes through and it has all the different things on abortion. You can read through this at your leisure. Here are some of the requirements for performance of abortion and the criminal penalties for that. Yes, they can do it as a medical emergency, but it there's very strict. I mean, you can't really do one after 20 weeks unless there is a real serious problem with the mother's life. So, you know, they've got a big crackdown on it. And there are a lot of things that they have to fill out. And if you go through and, you, you know, you look at this, you'll see a lot of things that they have to follow, a lot of procedures. But they're very strict about it. And the biggest thing is this 18 hours before the abortion. The pregnant woman will be informed orally and in writing of the following. That medical assistance benefits may be available for prenatal care, childbirth, and neonatal care from the county office of the Division of Family Resources. In other words, you have options. 
See, they have to tell them that they don't have to go for an abortion, that there is help if they decide to carry their child to term. That the father of the unborn fetus is legally required to assist in the support of the child. See, they have to tell them that too. So if the woman's going to have an abortion because she doesn't think the father is going to support the child and she's going to be all on her own, they're giving her options here. So I just think this is really a good thing to have in our law that they're required to do this. The abortion clinics are, they're not happy about it, but they're required to do this. And it goes through, uh, you know, the other things and adoption alternatives are available and that adoptive parents may legally pay the cost of prenatal care, childbirth and neonatal care. Women need to know this, but most abortion clinics will not tell them this because they only get money if the woman has the abortion. So they don't want to give the woman options. So, and that there are physical risks to the pregnant woman in having an abortion, both during the abortion procedure and after. And then Indiana has a safe haven law, which means they can, if they have the baby, they can hand the baby over at these locations and the child is taken from them. Not a problem, no questions asked, and they won't have to deal with the child. I mean, this is giving all the women the options they need to be aware of, that they don't have to have the abortion. And I, I think it's really great. Now, obviously, there are some of them that just have it in their mind. That's the only solution. But most of the time, women have abortions because they don't see any other way out. They they feel like, I can't do this by myself. I can't do this. Or there's a lot of pressure from boyfriends. There's a lot of pressure from families that they shouldn't continue to carry the child and then have the child. So this at least pr- makes them present the options to the women. And I, it, you know, other than just totally not allowing abortion, I think this is one of the best things you can do because most women, when they realize there are options, then, you know, that gives them hope. And it's hard to, you know, terminate the life inside of you. And I think this is something that gives them the possibility that, you know, if they carry that child, they will receive help. And Indiana is set up so that we can help people like that. So contrary to what a lot of liberals like to say is that we only care for the child when it's in the womb. That's not true. Okay. We have all of these laws enacted so that there is something to support the women if they carry their child to term. Anyway, and they have to give the internet website address of the State Department's health website and all of this. I mean, look at all this stuff they have to do. And they have like an emergency phone number they have to have that can be answered on 24 hour a day, seven day a week basis. They have to fill out forms. There are forms they have to have information. And, you know, it's just a lot that has to have um, a lot of paperwork. It, Yeah, that's true. They need to have that presented to them to have an informed decision. And too many times, you know, there's a push for the abortionist to get them in there and force them into a decision really quickly. Anyway, let's go on. Then we go back to the complaint. So you're going to be seeing those codes and really all it, the major codes was that they didn't tell the women uh, specifically or privately one-on-one about the risks and about the options and all the things that they had to present to them. And also that they weren't filling out paperwork with all the information that they had to have on it. And yeah, so right here, it says the respondent performed 1,818 abortions for patients of three of the three clinics. Now that would be Gary, South Bend and Fort Wade. Okay. Notice this number here, 1818. That's the number of abortions between 2012 and 2013 at that time. Now I want to ask you back here, here, It says they found 2,246 fetal remains. Okay, let's say the guy kept all of the fetal remains that he aborted. 
That's only 1818, at least during that time period. Now, maybe he kept some from before that. I don't know. But why? Why would anyone keep that? Anyway, if you go down here and you look at this particular document, what I found out, this is, you know, the complaint. And what I discovered is the Indiana State Department of Health actually does biennial surveys on abortion clinics. Again, something that needs to be done because you don't want abortions going on in very bad places. So women end up dying. We don't want that. So anyway, it talks about that. And there, here were some of the reports. Now, what I'm going to do is go down here because this is a list of the things they were supposed to include in the documentation, in the paperwork. And this is what they were not including. They have to have the age of the woman, the place where the abortions performed, the full name and address of the physicians performing the abortion, the name of the father, if known, the age of the father or approximate age of the father and the post-fertilization age of the fetus. And remember that if it's at over 20 weeks, there has to be an actual medical reason for the abortion and the medical procedure employed to administer the abortion, the mother's obstetrical history, including dates of other abortions, if, if any, because that can be very important, you know, when they're doing another abortion, there could be issues from previous ones. The results of pathological examinations have performed information as to whether the fetus was delivered alive, records of all maternal deaths occurring within the health facility where the abortion was performed, the date of the pregnancy termination, the date the form was received by the State Department. So those are the things they have to have in it. And again, when you're seeing all these codes, that's basically what they're talking about. Now, here's a big thing. A physician performing an abortion on a patient under the age of 14 years must submit the terminated pregnancy report all, with all those things on it, all this stuff up here, to the Indiana State Department of Health within three days of the abortion being performed. A failure to file a timely terminated pregnancy report is a Class B misdemeanor. Okay, and that is part of Indiana state law. There it is, the Indiana code that talks about it. And if a physician performing an abortion is separately required to certify the determination of the post-fertilization age of the fetus on the termina terminated pregnancy report, and there's the code for that, to that end, a physician performing an abortion is required to question the patient concerning the date of fertilization, primarily by asking about the date of the patient's last menses. So these, all these things were things they had to do. Now, here he had seven patients who signed consent forms on the same day the procedure was performed. But Indiana law says they have to wait 18 hours. They, there has to be an 18 hour difference between when they sign the form and when they have the abortion. And so there was not, and here are more six patients whose consent forms list a registered nurse or licensed practical nurse as the provider performing counseling prior to the procedure, and it was contrary to this Indiana code. The respondent performed an abortion on a 13-year-old patient. Respondent then failed to transmit the ISDH, a terminated pregnancy report, within three days. Because, you see, if it's a child under 14, then, you know, 14 and under, then they could be subject to child abuse. And that is likely why they're pregnant. So it needs to be reported. It's supposed to be reported. And then it's investigated. And here's another one on this date. See, this is a different date. This was 2012 and this was 2013. Respondent performed an abortion on a 13-year-old patient and he failed to transmit that within three days. I mean, it was like months before they were sent. So, yeah, like here, this one was 206 days is when they finally submitted it. Now, look at this. This part just is crazy. Okay, so he submitted 1,818 terminated pregnancy reports between January 2012 and November 2013. The reports contain multiple failures to comply with the requirements of the Indiana Code. And every one of the 1,818 terminated pregnancy reports was incomplete and incorrect. There were several fields on the forms that respondent frequently routinely 
failed to complete. At some point, respondent, and respondent means the guy, you know, eliminated the need to repeatedly handwrite unknown. He was so lazy, he didn't want to have to keep writing unknown on the abortion papers. So what did he do? He prepared or had prepared for his use a form with unknown pre-printed in several fields. So he already said unknown on there without even bothering to ask the woman the questions. What a liar. I mean, he was just faking stuff. Anyway, look at this. This is what's boggling your mind here. Respondent entered unknown or left blank the field for the father's name 1,818 times, 100% of the time. He never put in the father's name. Now, you're telling me nobody out of 1,800 women, not one of them gave him the father's name? You know he didn't ask. Anyway... Uh, and then he entered unknown or left blank the father's age or approximate age 100% of the time. You know, this is the thing. It says very clearly in the law, this is what you have to do. Oh, this one, two times he actually found out the post-fertilization age of the fetus. I don't know whether he actually did find that out. You know, if he asked her and it it just didn't get recorded or what, but it's not on the report that he was supposed to send in, the official report. He failed to record dates of prior terminations for patients who indicated they had prior abortions or miscarriages 601 times, 33% of the time. And again, it's something that's required. And this one failed to record the results of a pathological examination on reports that indicated a pathological examination had been performed 672 times, 36.9% of the time. (sighs) I mean, this guy failed to record the date of the patient's last menses 495 times. This guy was just not even following the law at all. The law is very clear. It says you have to do those things. And he didn't. And so it came out that out of these 1,800 18 forms that he failed to provide 7,224 fields of required information. Out of 1818, 7224. In other words, an average of four fields per form. The guy was not doing what he was supposed to do. Why wouldn't he? Because he was too busy collecting money? I don't know. Too busy ending little lives. Anyway, then it goes through and it, you know, gives the actual violations here that, you know, they didn't tell the women, they didn't uh, inform the women like they were supposed to. And it just, it gives the whole thing, all the different violations that they were um, saying that he did. And there's just one after the another, another on here. So anyway, and it's signed by Greg Zeller there. So uh, down here is... The chart, I mean, from here on, this is page 11, and from 11 to 55, this is a chart that shows, you know, the pa- did they do the patient's age? Well, yeah, usually they had the patient's age, and, you know, then it asks the number of spontaneous, I would say, how many abortions they've had. If they've had, uh, you know, induced, if, you know, how many times they've been induced, prior term dates, pathological examination, um, you know, in the results, in the menses. I mean, these are all the things they're supposed to have. And it goes through and up here's the legend for it. So, you know, and then these are the three places, Fort Wayne, Gary, and South Bend. So, yeah, you go through this and you see here were some issues. This one says timely because it was a 13-year-old and should have been sent in right away within three days. Nope, not done. So... Anyway, it just, yeah, I mean, you see all these. I mean, the check marks were the things that were done right. But all the rest of this, this is stuff, the you, unknown, unknown, unknown. So, yeah, one of those things. It just is really kind of crazy that somebody could be doing this and then trying to help women, right? 
At least that's what people are saying. Well, anyway, this was one of the old charges. This was from 2015. And like I said, they dismissed the charges after the guy went through this kind of probationary period. And then they dismissed the charges. And he did it again. And they dis and they he went through the probation again. And then they dismissed the charges. So, you know, finally it got to the point where in November of 2016, the licensing board gave their findings and they they took away his medical license. Thank goodness. Anyway, and so what did they find? Here's all the information about him. And, you know, it has to give here were the places that he worked and these three clinics. Oh, by the way, this guy, where is it? Oh, yeah, he's a doctor of osteopathy. So he's an osteopath. There you go. Right? And not that I'm going to say anything bad about osteopaths, but he's not a gynecologist. And so his specialty is not women's reproductive systems. So that would kind of disturb me. And um, he was also... he was. At these three clinics, respondent provided general gynecological care, first trimester abortions, and vasectomies. Okay, so so is an osteopath like qualified to do those things? I mean, I, they're more of a general medical doctor, aren't they? At least as far as I know. I don't know. Maybe some of you are medical personnel out there and you know, but just kind of seems an odd thing for somebody who has no real gynecological training, you know, not a specialty in that to be doing abortions and then vasectomies. Uh, I don't know. Anyway. Um, so the respondent performed surgical and medical abortions at the clinics and he continued to perform both medical and surgical abortions at one or more of the clinics through November, 2015. So then it goes through and it talks about all the different things that he did in 2014 here. They conducted a survey and they found out they had got 15 patients who underwent a surgical procedure as well as personnel files for the uh, employees at Women's Pavilion Clinic. This is what he did. He gave some patients sedation medications and it was usually those who were 16 years old and younger who had not previous, previously been pregnant. And if they were adults, if they were over 16, make them pay more, those who requested the medication and paid additional for the medication. So if they were adults, they were older than 16, they had to pay for the medication to have a sedation medication to go through this. And they were not being monitored like they were supposed to with the right kind of personnel. They didn't have the medical assistant, you know, and the patient would not be connected to any monitoring device. There's some, you know, bad stuff here. They were not being watched like they were supposed to. There was, look at this, okay? There, the clinics were equipped with defibrillators in each procedure room and the recovery room. Respondent, means the guy, Hopefer, received training in using a defibrillator in the 1970s, but is not advanced cardiac life support certified. Yeah, that's who you want to be there in case something goes wrong and you need somebody to start your heart again. You need somebody who learned how to work a defibrillator back in the 1970s. Yeah, and is not certified. Oh, I mean, just kind of scary when you think about it. Because, you know, when you're talking about sedatives, people respond differently. And sometimes people can have a bad reaction. And maybe some of these younger girls, especially if they were not, uh, you know, if maybe they'd never had that sedative before or anything. So you don't know how they're going to react. So I think that was just very dangerous. But anyway, and then here it's talking about, you know, signing the consent form on the same day the abortion procedure was performed. That's against the law. There has to be 18 hours at least. And, you know, so they went through and they did these surveys and they found out that all this stuff was going on. And that's what this document is about. So these are different records that they found out were 
had violations, that the guy was not following the law of Indiana. Okay, here's the 13-year-old and another 13-year-old, and they were not um, reported within three days like they're supposed to. And so he had a failure to timely file a public report, and that is a Class B misdemeanor. So, yeah, that was a big part of it. And so this is what they said. He entered into a plea agreement and he received a deferred prosecution. I guess that's what they called it, deferred prosecution. It was kind of like a probationary period of the Class B misdemeanor and agreed to be monitored by the pretrial diversion program. That always sounds weird to me. For one year and pay court costs and fees. And so that was 2015. Well, 2016... They dismissed it because he had he complied with the pretrial diversion agreement. And then he was criminally charged in St. Joseph County. St. Joseph County is the county that South Bend is in. So he was charged again for failing to timely file a public report, a Class B misdemeanor. And again, for an abortion on a 13-year-old. I mean, this guy just... Oh. And he had to pay the fees and everything and they did it to they did it again they let it he went through it twice he got that pre-trial diversion thing agreement and then it the case was dismissed but yeah and he didn't you know look at this earlier in his career respondent terminated a pregnancy on a 10 year old patient who reported to him she had been raped Respondent did not report that child to any law enforcement agency. Now, from what I read in one article, it was that there was an uncle that uh, got her pregnant and they didn't want to prosecute the uncle. Yeah, uh-huh, right. That should not have happened. She was 10. She was a 10-year-old little girl. Oh. So anyway, this is what the situation was. Finally, the ultimate finding is that there was a vote of five to one to zero that the respondent's conduct as described above constitute a violation of Indiana, this code right here, in that he has failed to keep abreast of current professional theory and practice in that he has failed to ensure the that qualified staff were present when the patients received and or recovered from lidocaine and state all medications given prior to and during abortion procedures. So I'm not sure. I think this... Five said yes, one said no, and I don't know if that's like an abstain or what. I don't know what, what the third number is, but they were all zeros on the third number. And then this one was a 600, said that he uh, didn't, he failed to document in patients' medical records that information and counseling was being provided and to patients at least 18 hours prior. Uh, this was a 420 that said he uh, failed to document in patients' medical records that information and counseling was provided at least 18 hours prior. The difference is this was a surgical abortion procedure and this was a medical abortion procedure. So this would be like by pill, I'm assuming, and this would be actual where they go in and have to go inside the womb and pull the baby out body part by body part. Anyway, um, this was a 600 on this one and that he knowingly violated a state statute or rule re regulating the medical profession, which was the three-day reporting rule, and he did that twice. And due to professional incompetence as a respondent, has continued to engage in a pattern of conduct, yes, I would say so, which demonstrates an inability to exercise reasonable care. And in, a poor, in providing abortion services, as is normally exercised by practitioners in the same or similar circumstances. So anyway, the conclusion is he had his license placed on indefinite suspension and no right to apply for reinstatement for at least six months. <sighs> yeah, so I guess he could have applied in six months, but oh, man. I mean, really, after all that, should he have been able to continue? I don't think so. But anyway, then he also had to do these things. He had to show that he was going to 
follow those things. He had to get some continuing medical education hours. He had to get some on ethics and child abuse reporting for sure. You know, and these were in obstetrics and gynecology. Well, we would hope that he'd keep up with that, but it doesn't sound like he did. And then he had to pay a fine of $4,000 and he had to pay court costs, which was sixteen seven, And, you know, so he did have to do this stuff. And then this was in 2016. And then from there, he ended up, I guess, retiring because I think he was old enough that he figured it wasn't worth the fight. So I don't know, but very scary that this was going on. Now, I want to show you this article. This is from uh, WANE.com, which is a Channel 15 in Fort Wayne. Klopfer was believed to be Indiana's most prolific abortion doctor, with thousands of procedures performed in multiple Indiana counties over several decades. So that's what, you know, we're saying. And if you happen to know the House representative from up here, her name's Jackie Wolorski. And she said the discovery of fetal remains, uh, she called it sickening beyond words. And he was responsible for thousands of abortions in Indiana and his careless treatment of human remains is an outrage. So I want, I want to show you this one last one. This is from the South Bend Tribune, which again is, you know, from Pete Buttigieg's town. But look at the title. Look at the headline here. Pro-choice and anti-abortion advocates. So does that tell you right there the bias of the person who wrote this? Pro-choice, but anti-abortion. Yeah, they do that. I mean, look for it. The anti-abortion, the minute you see that, you know that the person is anti-anti-abortion. That's for sure. Or they would say pro-life. Why don't they say pro-choice, pro-life, you know? Or why don't they say anti-choice and pro-life? But oh no, they don't want to do that. Anyway, both sides, this is what this person is saying, advocates express shock at the discovery of fetal remains at Dr. Ulrich George Klopfer's home. And again, this is from the South Bend Tribune. And people on both sides of the abortion debate were shocked to hear that more than 2,200 medically preserved fetal remains were found at the Illinois home of the late jo Ulrich George Klopfer, a former South Bend abortion clinic doctor. But pro-choice supporters are saying it's too early to rush to judgment, while pro-life advocates say the discovery is more proof stricter regulations are needed or for abortion to be outlawed altogether. And then it goes on and talks about, you know, he died on September 3rd. He was 75 and they found 2246 fetal remains. And then you go down here a little ways. This just, you know, South Bend Tribune. We know where you stand. We know whose side you're on. <sighs> but anyway, you go down here. I got to show you this. Dr. Evelyn Stecker, retired family doctor who's vocal about women's reproductive health issues. It says, without yet knowing when the remains were collected and Klopfer's intent, Stecker said, people should hold off rushing to judgment. We should not jump to horrible negative conclusions until we have more information. Honey, what more information do you need? The guy had 2,200 baby body parts in his house. Okay, we're not talking in some kind of clinic. We're talking in the man's house, okay? And we're not supposed to jump to horrible negative conclusions? What conclusion is there? Normal people do not keep baby body parts in their house, okay? I don't care whatever the laws were previously about how you take care of fetal remains, you don't store them in your house. Only a very sick, sick person would do that. Okay? You don't do that. Normal people do not keep baby body parts around. No. So anyway, I, just, I read that and it's just like, what? I cannot believe this. Abortion opponents will be quick to use the incident to try to limit women's reproductive health care and discredit other clinics, Stecker said. 
It's important to know that women in the community want and need to have abortions, she said. There are times when they need to make that decision, and they deserve the best way to do this safely. Ah. <sighs> And then she goes on, it says, Stecker did say she found it puzzling that Klopfer kept so many remains, but one would think he was trying to accomplish something. He was trying to accomplish something? What? Wait, wait. He had baby potty parts. He had 2,000. He didn't just have a few. He had over 2,200 baby body parts in his house. And you're saying... One would think he was trying to accomplish something. What? What? What in the world could he be trying to accomplish with that? I mean, I just, I, I can't even wrap my brain around someone who would say that. Well, I think he was just trying to accomplish something. What? Insanity? Um, you know, stocking up food for later? I, I just don't know. Because... In my mind, I cannot conceive of why anyone in the world would want to have any baby body parts in their house. And then to take it another step, I can't imagine what would be the use of having all of them, that many of them there. I mean, serious, if he was going to do some kind of, you know, if he was doing like a experiments or if he was like dissecting them or something is sick enough but you wouldn't need 2200 and where did he get those i mean he only performed 1818 in the last few years so are these like baby body parts he's been stockpiling for years normal people do not do this this is not normal this is sick these people are sick and that guy right there was sick. And for this woman, she's a doctor for Pete's sake. And she's defending him. She found it puzzling, but, oh, you know. Oh, well, it's a little strange, but, you know, he was probably trying to accomplish something. And just, oh, really? I, I just, I'm, I'm so, I, did, I can't even talk. I can't even talk about this because... I cannot believe somebody would make a statement like that. That woman is as sick as he is. She just doesn't know it. And then, of course, you know, we have a right to life. At least they gave the right to life side here. I'm glad that they did that. And, you know, that the, uh, the thing is, I do have to remind you, and I don't know where I thought it was in this article somewhere, but I'm not seeing it right now. But the thing is, in Indiana, there's a requirement now. It's part of the law that Pence had enacted. He signed it into law that now fetal remains must be cremated, okay, or buried. There is no other option. You cannot sell baby body parts. You cannot stockpile them in your house. That's not legal. Okay, and I realized the guy was in Illinois. Maybe Illinois law is a little bit different. Who knows what that says? But I know that if he was working in Indiana, if any of those babies came from Indiana, then he did something illegal, quite illegal, especially if any of them came from 2012 on when that law was enacted. So, yes, he cannot... Cannot stockpile baby body parts in your house. You have to cremate them or you have to bury them with respect because uh, they are a human life is what they are. So that's part of the law. That's what we have to say. So anyway, I'll leave all the links down below for you. You can read through them on your own if you've got the stomach for it. But this guy, kind of glad that he's gone on because he knows the truth now and I'd hate to be him standing in front of God, his maker, because the disrespect that he has shown to uh, human life is just something that, you know, you're not going to get a wink and a nod from God on that for sure. It's something he's going to have to pay for. So, you know, God's the one who created us. So when you start trying to play God in people's lives, and especially when you're ripping little children out of wombs. Yep, 
something's not right with you. And that, my friends, is evil. So, sorry to be a little bummer here on that, but I felt you needed to see more than just the basic picture that we've been hearing. And some of the articles, I felt they were a little thin. So I wanted to give you the tools so you can read through them and you can see for yourself the crime that this man committed over and over. And then he, he was, the charges were dismissed because he behaved himself for short periods of time and he was a medical doctor. So check your medical doctors, I guess, is all I can say, because this guy shouldn't have been able to practice on animals, but yet he was still, he was still doing abortions. So anyway, that's what I've got for you on this one. Again, so sorry. If you want something lighter here, let me just tell you that I did a couple of videos on my Garden Devotions channel, and one of them is on Peyton Dragon Eyes, and the other one is on setting the dragon eyes into polymer clay. So if you want to go over there, that will be much happier and a better topic to kind of leave off on. Besides, what I'm trying to do is I want to try to run these two YouTube channels in tandem. So I do want to continue doing this channel every day, putting something up. But uh, right now I'm trying to get on my feet with the other one too. And I want to do that two or three times a week with little crafty things or gardening things or, you know, uh, it's different stuff. So, you know, it would really be a help to me if you're interested in crafting things or the gardening issue or whatever, if you would subscribe to that one too, because in order to monetize the channel, I have to have a thousand subscribers. And right now I'm at like two something, almost three, I think. But I need a lot more subscribers over there. And I also need uh, to get 4,000 viewing hours, which right now I don't have a whole lot. <laughs> so uh, if you could help me out with that, that would be great. If it's not your thing, hey, I totally understand. I'm not pushing you over there or anything. I just wanted to give you the option, let you know what I'm trying to do. See, I figure that if I can get crafting videos and gardening videos going, that once they're monetized, YouTube won't demonetize them because they're like good things and hopefully they won't be something that YouTube sees as a threat. So, um, you know, this channel does tend to get demonetized a lot. And when it does, like for instance, I don't expect this video to be monetized. I'm pretty sure it won't, but I forced them to tell me, you know, to send me a letter saying that, no, we're not going to monetize it because I want to have, I have a record of that. I've got copies of all of them when they've been saying that. So I can show and say, look at all of these that they demonetized. Or I can say, look at all of these that were demonetized. And within about 24, 48 hours, they monetized them. But that was after I got most of my views. So I want to have some things, you know, stashed away and I want them to have to say yes or no we're going to monetize or not monetize so I've got proof of that anyway um so yeah if you want to join me over at garden devotions I would be so happy about that that would be really nice and uh if you don't I totally understand guys you know some of you are just not into those kinds of things and that's fine with me I just thought I'd give you the option and besides it helps me end on a little lighter note than what I had because, oh my goodness. But on the very lightest note, I think the IG report's going to be out really soon. So I'm looking forward to that. Gonna be some good time. So pop up some popcorn and don't forget, I've got a shirt that says more popcorn. So you know, check that out. See if you want to get one so you can wear your popcorn proudly. I had my Q shirt on today and uh, I had a couple people ask me about it and I got to explain who Q was. One was happy about that and one was not. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, people have different reactions. So I just kind of take it with a grain of salt. And I now have a big Q outside of my house on the front lawn. So yeah, I found one, you know, they have like these yard signs. And so I got one that's a big Q. Anyway, there's something special that I'm working on. And I hope maybe I can get it out for Monday. We'll see what happens. But it kind of depends on what, what goes on tomorrow. So anyway, I'll let you know. 
And so that's all I'm going to say tonight. I want to thank you for stopping by, and I will see you all later. Bye.